Hey, Rob. You know, it is. I am so happy to be able to do this video review series with a fellow Miami grad. Hey, that's right. I forgot we both went to Miami. Uh, yeah, go Red Hawks. Re no, no, go go Hurricanes. Miami Hurricanes. No, in, in Florida. Red Hawks, Oxford, Ohio. Red no. Hawks. Woo! Coral Gables, Miami, Miami Hurricanes. No. No, no, Red Hawks. Oh, Ooh, this is this is awkward. That's awkward. That's very okay. Awkward. Yeah. Well, hey, go Miami. Go Miami. There you go. Go Miami. All right. Hey, welcome everybody to day seven of the 2020, 2022 edition of AP Daily Live. Um, I'm Rob Schultz. I teach at Bellbrook High School in Bellbrook, Ohio. And I'm Tim Gallagher, and I teach at Winter Springs High School in Orlando, Florida. And we are so thrilled that you were with us again today. Um, we hope that you are enjoying the sessions and getting a lot out of them and are feeling a little more comfortable as we review some of the material. Uh, Tim, you want to do some shout outs before we get things going? Let's do it, Rob. OK, um, how about Seattle Public Schools, AP Computer Science A and obviously Seattle? Awesome. Uh, Burgess Towns Area High School in Burgess Town, Pennsylvania. Shout out to them. Okay, and I'd like to send a shout out to Washington High School in Fremont, California. Fantastic. How about University View Academy in Baton Rouge, Louisiana? Oh, nice accent, too. Uh, how about is it Canny Creek High School in Conroe, Texas? Yes, and uh, to the folks at Wackahatchee High School. All right, and finally, how about Westminster Christian High School in Elgin, Illinois? Welcome, everyone. We are so happy that you're here. Um, let's see. Let's take a look. Uh, we probably need to jump right in because we've got a lot to cover today. Let's take a look at what we are going to learn. All right, so uh, let's see. We're going to start. Tim is going to share some multiple choice question tips for our bit of the day. We're going to look at searching and sorting algorithms. You know, we're on day seven of our, our series, and we haven't really looked at searching or sorting algorithms yet. Um, as always, we're going to do some multiple choice question review, and then we're going to wrap things up with a look at the trail free response question from the 2010 exam. We're going to go back in the archives for a ways, but, uh, but man, I love that question. It's such a fun one. And Maggie down in the corner says hello. Uh, so hello, Maggie. How are we doing today? Um, all right. So Tim, you want to go ahead and pick it up from there? Let's do it. Okay. Okay. So here we go with today's bit of the day. And we are going to talk about the types of multiple choice questions and some hints and everything when taking the AP exam, uh, specifically the multiple choice questions. So let's talk about the types of multiple choice questions first. And we've been looking at a whole bunch of different questions. And if you'll notice, we've been covering a lot of different skills. We've been talking about uh, questions that uh, the different types of questions that you'll see on the exam themselves. So looking at these, we see things like, what does this method do? Um, you're going to look at questions, you know, what type of, of, of values are output or what's displayed on the screen. Can you follow the algorithm? And that's an important skill. Can you determine what this code segment is going to do and what does it produce? Can you look at what's wrong with the code? Can you fix the code and determine the correct answer or determine what's wrong with the code or what might prove a, uh, a code segment to be incorrect? Can you complete code? We've seen a lot of questions where there's missing code, and can you determine what should go there in order to make the code segment correct? And then things like class methods and how they access private data, string manipulation, making sure that you know how the string class works and all the methods of the string class. Also, there may be some language independent questions. We're going to be talking about sorting algorithms, and sorting algorithms aren't necessarily Java based, but they're questions that you could answer um, regardless of the programming language. We're also going to make sure uh, that you uh, understand about array and 2D array and array list traversals in the multiple choice questions as well, knowing how to access values in there and, and how to manipulate those data structures. Also, using list of objects and using I have in there object.method.method.method. If you have a list and you need to use a, a dot get method and then maybe get an attribute of that object and then see if it dot equals something, understanding how those all work together. Inheritance hierarchy, we talked a lot in the last video about inheritance and understand how those work. Uh, binary and sequential searches, as well as sorting algorithms. We're going to talk about those today. And then also just when you're looking at loops, um, looking at your the boundaries and being off by one. And we've seen some examples of those. We'll look at those as well. And then finally, recursion. There's always going to be a few questions on those. So th those are just a, a, a kind of an overall view of, of uh, the majority of the types of, of multiple choice questions you would see. 
And then in the course and exam description itself, it has this breakdown of the different units we have. And there's 10 units in the course and exam description for uh, AB Computer Science A. And this is a percentage breakdown of what, per how many questions you'll see out of the 40 multiple choice questions on each of these topics, right? So if you figure there's uh, 40 multiple choice questions, each question is about two and a half percent of, of the test. So you'll notice that if, if you're worried that there's going to be of the 40 questions, 30 of them are going to be about recursion. Well, that's not true because look at unit 10 recursion, only five to 7.5%. So two to three questions about recursion possibly. Notice where the biggest percentages lie. Uh, units three and four, which is Boolean expressions and if statements and iteration. Knowing if statements and knowing how to loop through um, is a huge skill. And those could be in lots of different questions, whether they're about data structures or whether they're just about method and controls questions. Um, you'll notice that array unit six, uh, 10 to 15 percent of the questions about arrays, while only two and a half to seven and a half percent about array lists. So not as many array list questions as there would be array questions. And then 2D arrays. 7.5 to 10% on 2D arrays. So most likely you'll see more 2D array questions than you will array list questions. And that's just to get you prepared to understanding what type of breakdown you'll see in the multiple choice section of the AP Computer Science A exam. Finally, I want to close out the bit of the day with our multiple choice question tips. So I'm taking this, I, I know what's going to be on here, and I know what type of skills I need to, to utilize, and I know uh, the content. Now I'm taking the exam. What are some tips we have for, for answering these questions? Well, first of all, whenever you have a multiple choice uh, question, make sure you read every answer. I, that sounds silly, but a lot of times I have students who will see the first answer, go, that must be it, and, and put down A, and then realize, oh, no, I misread it. Or there's a better answer, and now I realize that A wasn't a correct answer. D was the correct answer. So read every question. Be careful about answers that say always and never, right? Because those are very exclusive words. And those might be right, but I, I, a little bit of a red flag there when you when you think about words that uh, the, the words always and never in answers. Be sure that those are exactly uh, the answers that you want to have. Since there are no penalties for incorrect answers, be sure to answer every single question. But don't randomly guess, right? You want to make educated guesses. Like we've seen on the multiple choice questions that we've done on these videos, eliminate answers as you go if possible because that just narrows down your choices. So if you have to guess at the end, you're making an educated guess. And even working backwards can can work. Uh, what Can I plug some some values into variables that they may have given us as an answer and, and see if you can do that to um, help determine what the answer on a multiple choice question is. When solving a question that involves code, don't necessarily read the code first and try to understand it thoroughly. Read the question and then go back to the code. A lot of times I find students will, will try to really understand code and then the question is something that wasn't even something that they were looking at on the code. Maybe it's asking about a method and they were really focused on the constructor of a class. And, and so understand what it is you're looking for really helps out by looking at the question first. A lot of times you'll see a, uh, multiple questions that are based on one set of code. And if you can't get the first question, that's okay. Do the second question. If you can get that, maybe now you have a better understanding of the code. You can go back and, and answer that first one. Also, we've mentioned before about keeping track of variables and using white space on, on each paper as you're going through loops or going through recursion or just keeping track of lots of variables uh, in your algorithm. Definitely use the uh, the test itself and any scrap paper that you have to keep track. And then finally, um, skipping questions. A lot of times students want to skip a question and then come back to it later, and, and that's fine. But if you skip a question, go ahead and answer it first because a lot of times you find that if you make a guess, you probably have already eliminated one or two answers. And what if you don't have time to go back to it? At least now you're making an educated guess. And if you have time to go back to it, fantastic. So those are, those are just some tips for taking multiple choice, uh, the multiple choice portion of the AP exam, and hope that works out well for you. All right. So Rob, uh, what do we say we get into our content review here? OK, that sounds great. And those were great tips, by the way. Thanks. Um, I feel like those are actually great tips if if you're taking any multiple choice, not not just the AP. Definitely.
Okay, so let's get into some root uh, a review. I can't speak today. Um, we're going to get into some review. Um, so let's let's take a look at our searching and sorting algorithms. Now, I'm going to tell you up front, we could really spend an entire 45 minute session on any of the sorting algorithms or on the search algorithms by themselves. And time is kind of short. So unfortunately, we don't have enough time to really talk about how they do what they do. We're going to spend some time talking about what each of these algorithms do. And I'm going to give you an example of each. Um, and then at the end, I'll give you some resources so that if you feel like you want more information about the code behind them or or how the mechanism of the algorithm works to make them work the way they, they are supposed to, um, I'll, I'll give you some resources where you can find some more information. But unfortunately, with the session time that we've got, we just really don't have as much time as we would like to really dig into all of the nuts and bolts and all the details. So we're going to start with searching algorithms. We've got two searching algorithms that were required to, to make sure that we understand for the exam. One is called linear search and one is called binary search. And then we also have three sorting algorithms. We have insertion sort, selection sort, and merge sort. And we're going to start with our searching algorithms. I'm going to move part of my screen in a little bit here. Um, OK, so with our linear search, the, the reason that I said that we could combine both of the searching algorithms into a 45 minute session, linear search, we've pretty much already covered. So binary search would be the majority of that time. Um, you know, linear search is really just an array or array list traversal. You know, there isn't really much to it. We start at the beginning and we work comparing uh, element by element and by element until we find what we're looking for. Um, the nice thing about a linear search is the data does not need to be in sorted order. I'm just going to find the first occurrence maybe of, of whatever the value is that I'm looking for. Um, it's going to return the index position if I find the value that I'm looking for, and it's going to return negative one if it's not found. So, so let me give you an example. Let's say I call a linear search method with the value one. Okay, we're going to do just, again, a basic array traversal. Let's assume we're looking at an array, not an array list. We're going to start at index position zero, and we're just going to traverse through our array comparing element by element until I find a match with the value that I'm looking for, my target. And as soon as I find a match, I'm looking for the value one. I found the value one at index position three. We're going to return the value three, and, and that's the end. Um, if I do a search for a linear search for the value two, well, again, we're going to go back and we're going to start at position zero. We're going to traverse the entire array doing our comparison, comparing every value to our target. And if by some chance I get all the way to the end and haven't found what I was looking for, then I'm going to return negative one. And, and that's a linear search. So again, um, we've talked about traversals in, in some, of our past, uh, some of our past videos. Um, and really, a linear search is just a, a basic array, array list traversal. OK, now binary search, on the other hand, is a little different. OK, binary search is a divide and conquer algorithm, which means that we're going to end up splitting some things in half as we go. Um, and for a binary search to work, and I'll explain why in just a second, the data has to be in sorted order. So I can't use a binary search for random data. It has to be it has to be sorted before I can start either ascending or descending order. Um, just like linear search, it's going to return the index position if it's found, and it's going to return negative one if it's not found. And I want to point out by with with this one, the fact that it's a divide and conquer algorithm. Now, now granted, most of these could be done both iteratively and recursively, but we're going to we're going to bring that back up again when we talk about merge sort in just a second. So I wanted to specifically point out that binary search could be solved iteratively or recursively. OK, so if I call binary search and I'm looking for the value eight. OK, here's how this is going to work. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to identify our lowest index position, not the value, but the index and the highest index position. And then I'm going to use those to find the middle of my array. So think about this. If I take 5 plus 0 and I get 5, 5 divided by divided by 2 in Java, int divided by int gives us 2 as our middle index position. What I'm going to do is I'm going to compare the value at that middle with my target value, 8. And because 8 is greater than 5, and I know that this is in sorted order, that means there's no possible way 8 could be to the left of the 5. It can't be in the array before it, which means I can pretty much ignore from my mid position all the way down, and I can reset the low position to whatever my middle, middle index position plus 1 would be, because I know that's now the lowest possible index position that could contain my value. And that's basically the idea of binary search. I'm going to repeat that process. I'm going to recalculate the middle. And in this case, we get a match. Our middle index, uh, our middle value, the value at our middle index position matches our target. So we're going to return four. Um, now, granted, I've only got six elements here. This would work a little, it would take a little longer if I had 
a thousand elements, but but the process is still the same. I eliminate half and then eliminate half and eliminate half. And you can almost picture it as the wall slowly closing in until I find the value I'm looking for. And so this algorithm is going to continue until I either find my target value or the walls cross. And as soon as I hit a point where low becomes greater than high, my low index position is, is higher than my high index position, that means the walls have crossed and I didn't find the value I was looking for. So that's our that's how we know when to stop. Okay. So there's our binary search. Binary search, we split it in half, split it in half, split it in half until we find or the walls cross. Okay. Let's look at our sorting algorithms. Okay. So the idea of insertion sort, we're going to start at index position one and we're going to work forward in our array. Okay. And here's what I mean by that. Um, we're going to assume that everything to the left of our of our starting index position is already sorted. Now, if I start at position one, there's only one value in front of it. And so by default, if I only have one value, that one value can't be out of order, okay? Um, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna insert the target value where it belongs in front of it in the list, all right? So if I start at index position one, we really don't have to worry about anything that comes behind it. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by taking six and I'm going to copy it out to a temporary kind of little holding variable. And then I'm going to start doing some comparisons. And because six is less than eight, I have to shift eight up one in my array. Well, now I've hit index position zero. There's really nowhere else for me to go. So by default, I know that six has to belong in that position. So I'm going to copy six back to position zero. Then we're gonna slide up and we're gonna look at index position two. And I'm gonna repeat the process. I'm gonna, I'm gonna copy the value from position two down to a temporary holding variable. I'm gonna do a comparison and say, okay, well, five is less than eight. So eight has to shift up. Five is less than six. So the six has to shift up. And now I can insert five. Again, we're back at position zero. There's nowhere else for me to go. So the five gets inserted at position zero. And that, and that process is gonna repeat over and over again. We're looking at index position three. Three has a value of one, so I copy the one. One is less than eight. One is less than six. One is less than five. And again, we're down to zero, so I have to insert the one at position zero. Well, now's where things in our example start to get a little interesting, right? We're at index position four. Four has a value of nine, so I'm going to continue as I normally would. I'll copy it out to the, to the temporary holding variable. But now when I compare, nine is not less than eight, which means I can't shift eight up. And because I can't shift eight, I have an open hole that is essentially the, the hole I just opened when I moved nine down. So nine is gonna go back to position four to keep everything in order, all right? And finally, we get to index position five, which has a value of three. I copy three down to my variable. Three is less than nine, so it shifts. Three is less than eight. Three is less than six. Three is less than five. But again, I find a, a point where three is no longer less than the value that I'm comparing it to which means we've identified the hole where three needs to be inserted. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna insert three at position one, and that's the end of our insertion sort. So that's where insertion, insertion sort gets its name. We're simply inserting it. Uh, we're inserting each value where it belongs in front of it in our array or our list, okay? So there's our insertion sort, all right? Um, the next one is selection sort. And selection sort is kind of, you could almost picture it as being kind of the opposite of insertion sort. Selection sort starts at position zero, where insertion sort, insertion sort started at position one. Um, we're going to find the minimum value to the right of the target. So we're not really shifting things around or sliding things around or inserting anything. Instead, I'm going to do a swap. So every time I pick a target value, uh, or I should say I have my target index position, I'm going to look to the right I'm going to identify where the minimum value is. And once I've identified the minimum, I'm going to swap. And if you remember uh, several videos ago uh, or, or several sessions ago, Tim went through some array and array list algorithms. One of those algorithms was finding the minimum value. So we're going to use an array traversal and the algorithm to find a minimum as part of our selection sort. So for example, if I started index position zero, we're going to work our way traversing through the entire array to identify what the lowest, what the minimum value is in the remainder of our array. And in this case, it's a one. So as soon as I've identified that one is the minimum, they swap. So the one swaps with the eight. Okay, 
we're going to move up to index position one, which has a value of six. And again, from that point to the right, I'm not going to go back to zero again, because then I'd end up swapping with the one. But starting with position one, starting with my target, I'm going to move to the right and identify whatever the minimum value is. And in this case, it's a three. So the three and the five swap. I'm sorry, the three and the six swap. Um, then I'm going to move up to index position two, where my value is a five. I'm going to repeat the process. I'm going to go all the way to the end, and I'm going to identify the minimum one. Well, in this case, five is the minimum, which means really you could kind of imagine that it's swapping with itself. It's basically standing up and sitting back down again. Okay, then we're going to go to index position three, which has a value of eight. I'm going to search the rest of the array, and I'm going to find that the minimum value is six, so they swap. I'm going to go to index position four, which has a value of nine. I'm going to work my way to the end of the array and find the minimum, which happens to be the eight. Um, and then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to uh, swap the nine and the eight. And I end up with a sorted list. OK, so that's our selection sort. And then that brings us to the last one. That brings us to merge sort. OK, so with our merge sort, we have a, another divide and conquer algorithm, which means we're going to end up splitting some things in half. OK, um, the idea of merge sort is I'm going to break my list into pieces. And as I put the pieces back together, or I merge them, I'm going to merge them in order. And this one, the reason I mentioned that binary search and other divide and conquer algorithm could be done iteratively or recursively, merge sort is a little different. Merge sort must be done recursively. Um, it, it's a recursive algorithm. So you'll hear about that one in unit nine of the CED or, or the materials that, that are covered in your class. Okay, so here's the idea of merge sort. We have a list uh, or an array that contains six elements. So the first thing we do is we split it into a left half and a right half. Okay, well, I'm gonna recursively call the algorithm again with only the left half of my array. So which that now means that I'm basically looking at a, an array that contains only three elements. And because the first thing I do is I split it, I'm going to treat this just like I did our original list. I'm going to split it into a left half and a right half. So now I'm recursively going to call my algorithm again, looking only at the left half. Well, I've only got one element, so I can't really split any further, which means the left side is pretty much done. So now I have to recursively go back and I'm going to recursively call the algorithm with the right half of my small little three element array. OK, again, first thing I do when I call the uh, call the algorithm is I split my list. And in this case, my list um, or my array only has two elements. I'm going to split it into a left half and a right half. And again, I'm going to focus on the left. Whoops, there we go. Well, I'm going to focus on the left Well, my left only has one element. I'm going to go back and I'm going to look at the right. The right only has one element, which means now that I've got a single element left and a single element right, I can merge them back together. And as I merge them, I'm going to put them in order based on which one comes first, OK? So the five comes before the six. So as I put this smaller right side you know, little mini array back together again, I'm going to end up with five and six as those two smaller pieces get merged back together. So now I have a completed left side. You know, Going back to my original, I guess my, my second you know, look at this thing, I've got my, my three element array. I have an, a left side that's complete. I have a right side that's complete. So now I'm ready to merge the left and the right of my three elements back together. And as I do that, again, I'm going to select them in the correct order so that five will come first and then six and then eight. So I've now completed the left side of my original six element array. OK, well, now that I've completed the left side, I have to go back and I have to recursively call with the right side. OK, and again, we're going to repeat this same process. Every time I call the algorithm, I'm going to I'm going to um, split into a left and a right. OK, and I'm going to focus on the left. Well, the left only has one element, which means it's pretty well set. I'm going to go back and I'm going to focus on the right and I'm going to break it into a left side and a right side. Well, each of those only have one element, which means they are ready to be merged back together. So when I merge nine and three back together, they're going to be merged in the correct order. I now have two complete pieces of my right side three element array, which means I have a one and then I have a three and a nine. So even though they're already in the correct order, I still have to merge them back together, which means I'm going to end up with one, three and nine. So now I'm back to my original six element array. I have a complete left side. I have a complete right side. Notice the left side is in order. The right side is in order. But now I need to merge the left and the right back together. And as they get merged, we're going to go through and we're going to pick them, uh, pick each element in the correct order. So I end up with one, three, five, six, eight, and nine.
Now, like I said, I know that's a lot to take in, especially merge sort in such a short period of time. So we have some additional resources that might give you a better, more in-depth look um, at the searching and sorting algorithm. So my recommendation would be to go back and go into AP Classroom, look at the AP Daily videos, look specifically at the videos for 7.1, which is searching, 7.2, which is sorting, and then 10.2, which is recursive searching and sorting. Another good resource would be the AP Daily Live review from 2021 and look specifically at session seven. We went into a little more depth last year because last year we didn't take as much time for multiple choice review and some other things. So we had a little more time to share on some of the, the more intricate details of how some of the algorithms work. Okay, so, so make sure you check these resources. Um, these will give you a little more information as, as to not necessarily, or I guess not only what the algorithms do, but also how they actually do it, okay? That's our review for today. Great stuff, Rob. Thanks, Tim. Awesome. And uh, hey, I'm going to go ahead and get control back and let's look okay. at um, some multiple choice questions. Hey, before we do, because we haven't had a, a good dad joke in a while, how, oh many, how many Java programmers does it take to change a light bulb? I don't know, Tim. I, I have no idea either. That sounds like a hardware problem. Okay, that one made me laugh really out loud. Oh, there I it like is. That one. Yeah, that's awesome. Awesome. Hey, let's uh, let's look at some multiple choice questions here. So, um, so we wanted to pick a couple that I had to to uh, focus on searching and sorting. So there's a couple here. And there's a whole bunch of possible questions out there. Again, looking at some of the um, uh, the questions on AP Classroom and also the endorsed providers and things like that will give you some great practice. Also. Um, here is one that involves a skill. Uh, it says, well, it says consider the following method find target, which is intended to perform a linear search on an array of integers by locating target. Uh, it should return true if it finds it false otherwise. And then notice the question says, which of the following pairs of parameters sent to this method would prove that find target does not work as intended? So this is one of those questions that it doesn't work. What's wrong here? And then not only do you have to determine, okay, I've, I found the error, then which of these values would help me show the error or would bring the error to light? So go ahead and hit pause and see if you can figure out what the mistake would be. Why is this linear search not behaving the way it should in certain instances? And which one of these sets of parameters would prove that the code is incorrect? Go ahead and hit pause and we'll come back in here in just a moment and trace through this question. Ready? Okay, here we go. So what's wrong with this question? So let's look at it. If it looks like a regular uh, regular searching algorithm, linear search, something's up though. Um, what about the loop? Does the loop look right? I know when, when Rob was talking about searching and sorting, we didn't always start at the beginning in some of the sorting algorithms, but for a linear search, don't we want to always start at zero? This one's always starting at one. So that doesn't mean it's always going to produce incorrect results, right? If I'm looking for an element and it happens to exist in position zero, then it's not going to be able to find that element. So which one of these answers tells me or will give me incorrect results based on this error that's in the code. So let's look at A. A says, if I give an array of one, two, three, four, five, is it going to find three? Well, sure. It'll start looking at position two or position one, which is the value two, and it'll find the three. So that's not going to show that it's incorrect. What about B? B, I'm looking for a 10. There is a 10 in there. It's at the very end of the array. It'll come back and return true that it found it. So that's not going to work. That's going to look like it, the the array, uh, the method works properly. Same thing with C. It's going to find the two in position uh, in position two. But then look at D. D says I'm looking for a target five, and where is five? It's in position zero. So this is going to return false. It couldn't find it because it didn't start at zero. It started at one. So D is my correct answer. That's going to be the one to show that the algorithm or the, the code segment was not written properly. And then of course, E is not my right answer as well. Now E looks different. E, it's not gonna find a five, right? So it's gonna return false. 
but that's correct. We should return false because it's not finding it. So the answer in this case happens to be D. A little bit of a different twist on some of the questions, and that's a different skill. Can you tell what's wrong? Can you debug the code? And once you do that, can you come up with some test data that'll show where that bug is? Hope you did well. Let's try one more. How about uh, this one? It says, which of the following show the contents after an array of the array after each outer loop iteration of an insertion sort? And we're going to be sorting in increasing order if the array initially contains 84206. So Rob just talked about insertion sort. Remember how he said that it, it goes through and it picks out the next element, each, uh, each element of the array, and it pulls it out and then it scoots things down, right? It does the shifting. So the shifting is my, my inner loop. But think about we talked about nested loops in an earlier video. Think about that outer loop. And the outer loop is every time I pull an element out and then I shift everything down and I put the element back. There's one iteration. So I would write this array down and sort it using an insertion sort and see which answer matches up of how that array looks like every time I do one full outer loop iteration of the insertion sort. Why don't we go ahead and hit pause again and we'll come back in just a moment and look at this question as well. Ready? Okay. So for this question, I would definitely write down the array so I could play around with it. So I'm going to write down here at the bottom, 8, 4, 2, 10, and 6. And I'm going to then perform an insertion sort. And whether you do this by scratching out numbers or maybe it's in pencil and you can erase and write things in here, but doing that insertion sort on this array I know it's going to be sorted at the end. That's not well, that's not what's in question. The question is, what's the array going to look like after each iteration of the outer loop? So what do I do first? Now, remember, Rob mentioned with an insertion sort, we don't start at zero, right? We start at one. So that's key. So where am I going to start? I'm going to start at position one, which is the four. And what do I do with an insertion sort? Well, I pull the four out. And then I start shifting over. Is four less than eight? Yes. So four is gonna eight's gonna get shifted over. And oh, I'm at the beginning of the array. So whoops, I went backwards. There we go. Uh, I put four in. So that's one iteration of my outer loop. And I look at the answers and go, wait a minute. There's only one that matches. B must be the answer, and, and it probably is. But I'm gonna keep going just to make sure that the rest of the arrays match as well too because maybe I did something wrong. So let's see what happens now. Well, I'm going to go to index number two, which is my two, and I'm going to pull that out. And what happens? Two is less than eight. So I shift it down. Two is less than four. I shift it down. And then two gets put up into the array. And that works so well with B as well. So that's my next uh, snapshot of what the array looks like after another iteration of the outer loop. Again, I'm going to go to the next one. Now I'm at 10. And this happened in Rob's example, too, where 10, I go to shift it, and, oh, 10 is not less than 8. There's nothing to shift, so 10 is just going to go right back in that spot. So notice, after another iteration of the loop, the array looks exactly the same as it did before because I just pulled one element out and put it right back. Now let's look at the 6, and what happens here? I pull the 6 out. I shift down the 10 because it's less than 10. 6 is less than 8. It's not less than 4, so I pop 6 back into the array here, and it is now sorted, and that's what my array looks like at the end. So what did we get? Hopefully you got B as a correct answer because that's what this looks like after we've completed the insertion sort, and that's what each uh, that's a little bit of a snapshot of each of the array after each iteration of the outer loop. How'd you do? Hopefully great well. Examples. Thanks. And, yeah. um, you know, I, I think these are these are really important. There's so many different multiple choice questions that deal with the different sorting algorithms and the different searching algorithms and uh, just making sure that you're able to understand not just the Java code, but even just the algorithm itself and making sure that uh, that you're really solid on those is a very important part for the exam. All right. Um, so we're up to our example. So I'm going to go ahead and give control back over to you, Rob. OK, got it. Okay, so um, like I said, 
this is one of my favorite free response questions. And I know we're digging back a ways to find this one. This is from 2010. This is free response question three, the trail question. And I've mentioned I like to hike. I, I do love to get out in the woods and hike a little bit. But this is just kind of a fun question because this one talks about trail markers and uh, checking the elevation along the trail as we go. So um, for this question, it says that we have a hiking trail or, or just any general hiking trail has elevation markers posted at regular intervals along the trail. Um, and it tells us elevation information about the trail can be stored in an array. They give us an example where each element in the array represents the elevation at a marker and the elevation at the first marker is going to be stored at position zero. So you can kind of see in the little graph here at our starting point of the trail, we're at an elevation of 100 meters. And then yeah, at this pre preset interval, um, I get a new elevation marker that tells me my elevation at that point. Um, it gives us a little more information and says elevations between markers are kind of ignored in the question. Well, that's OK. We know we have to climb or, or you know, increase our elevation or decrease our elevation in between. And then they tell us the, the graph to the right shows an example of our trail elevations. And the table below contains the data represented in the graph. So it's just kind of a nice, easy way to kind of represent what the data is that we're looking at. OK. Um, they give us the declaration of this trail class and I've got it here to the right and it says we're going to write two unrelated methods of the trail class. So let's look at what they're giving us here. Um, the first thing is we've got a private um, integer array instance variable called markers that represents the trail and it tells us the number of markers on the trail is whatever the length of the array is. If I've got 20 markers, then I have 20 elements in my array. Okay. Um, then we've got some information about the two methods we're going to write. So the first one is called is level trail segment. And notice they're giving us some parameters. It's a Boolean method, which means we're going to return either a true or a false. And then they're giving us a starting index position and an ending index position. So it says the purpose of this method is to determine if a trail segment's level. It says a trail segment is defined by a specific starting marker and a specific ending marker. So that tells us we're not necessarily starting at the beginning of our trail and ending at the end. They might give us a segment in between. But it also includes all of the markers between the two markers that were given, our start and our end. And it tells us a trail segment's level if it has a difference uh, let's see, there we go. A trail segment is level if it has a difference between the maximum elevation and the minimum elevation that's less than or equal to 10 meters. So here we are again with that traversal algorithm of finding our maximum and minimum. Okay. Um, they also give us, whoops, sorry, I went, went too far. They give us a little extra information. They tell us again what the parameters are. We've got start and end. They give us a precondition. And remember, we've talked about this in the past. We don't have to check to make sure the preconditions are met. We can assume these will be true. So we know that start has to be uh, greater than or equal to zero. End has to be greater than start, or I should say start has to be less than end. And end has to be less than or equal to whatever our last marker is, which is going to be markers.length minus one. And we're going to return true if the difference between maximum and minimum uh, on, on a specific segment of the trail is less than or equal to 10 meters, and otherwise we return false. Okay, so that's our part A. A lot of information to digest, so we'll come back and we'll review it again in, in a second. Um, we also have a second method uh, called is difficult that's also a Boolean method, but we have no parameters this time. And what this is going to do, and Tim, I hate this when I get a trail that I try and hike that's too difficult. Well, this method tells us whether our trail is difficult or not based on the, uh, counting the number of changes in elevation that are at least 30 meters, either up or down between two consecutive markers. So um, a trail with three or more such changes. If I'm on a trail and it has three elevation changes that are either more or less than 30, then that would be rated difficult and we're going to return true. Otherwise, we return false. And then it tells us that, yeah, there might be some other instance variables and constructors and methods as part of this class, but they're kind of inconsequential to this question. We don't really need to worry about them. OK, um, and by the way, if we did have any other methods we would need to worry about, remember, we've talked about this in the past. It would show us a declaration for the method and tell us that the implementation is not shown. So, so we don't necessarily have to worry about any of these. Oops, I forgot I had some little underlines there. All right, so um, let's look specifically at part A and let's look at an example. Okay, so for part A, we're going to write the method is level trail segment. Um, it tells us that, again, the trail maker, the trail segment is defined by a starting marker and an ending marker and all of the markers in between. Um, it tells us the parameters of the method are the index of the starting marker and the index of the ending marker. 
And then um, again, it repeats some information about the question, but then it gives us an example. And it says for the trail shown at the beginning, which I've copied to the bottom of the slide again to make it easier to see, it says the trail segment starting at marker seven and ending at marker 10 has elevations ranging between 70 and 80 meters. So 70 is our minimum, 80 is our maximum. And it tells us that because the difference between our minimum elevation and our maximum elevation for that entire segment is less than or equal to 10, this is considered a fairly level trail segment. So we're okay. Um, we've got a second example that says, if I look at the segment starting at marker two and ending at marker 12, okay, we have um, one, trail elevation of 120, that's our maximum. And then we get to our minimum, which has an elevation of 50. And because the difference between 120 and 50 is greater than 10, this trail segment is not considered level. Okay, that looks like it's quite a change in elevation from, from where I start to where I finish if I get to 120 and 50 in between. So our goal now is to go back and write the is level trail segment method, knowing that we have to find the minimum, minimum and maximum and determine whether or not that the difference between the two is greater than or equal to 10 and return the result. Okay, so I'm going to ask you to pause. Take a pause. This is part A. And remember, we've got on average about 22 and a half minutes per question um, in including both parts. So take about half that time. If we've got 22 minutes, give yourself, you know, 10 to 12 minutes maybe, um, and see if you can think about the algorithm, think about how this is gonna work, um, think about our array traversal algorithms and how I might find um, the minimum and the maximum between my starting and ending point. And then see if you can put a solution to this problem together. And when you're ready, press play and we'll come back and chat. So again, take 10 to 12 and then uh, press play and we'll talk some more. Okay, we are back. So let's take a look at what we've got. Um, so we start with our method header. You know, we've got um, a public method. It's got a Boolean return type. We've got the name is level trail segment and we're given our two parameters, start and end, both integers. Okay, so the first thing we have to do, we know that we're gonna do an array traversal and we have to use an algorithm that's gonna find the minimum and maximum. So the very first thing we need to do is we need to define a variable that's gonna contain our minimum and a variable that's gonna contain our maximum. And I always tell my students to start with whatever the first value is that we're looking at in our data set. Now I've had students in the past that have said, well, you know, why can't I use zero for, for the maximum? Because, uh, or, you know, zero is the starting value or use this value for the starting value. Well, we don't really know anything about our data. This is an example, but it's not the only one data set we're gonna have to work with. You know, I might have a data set that has all negative values if my trail happens to be below sea level. I might have a trail segment that, that has a spike of, 2000 feet, who knows, right? So we, we can't really assume anything about our data. So we're always safest if we include data that comes directly from our data set. So this way, if I say that we're gonna start min and max at whatever our starting trail marker is, then I'm guaranteed to either have a minimum maximum because that will be it, or I'm gonna find something as I continue to progress through the array that's going to be either bigger or smaller. So we always wanna stay within our data. Okay, then we have to traverse our array. Okay, so we've already set min and max to our starting value, which means we really don't need to look at it again. So as we traverse our array, we can start our index position at start plus one. We're gonna go up to including the end because we've been told that our trail markers start and end are inclusive. So we need to make sure we're looking at our ending trail marker too. We have to make sure we're doing less than or equal to. And then this is where we get into that algorithm that's going to that's going to check for a min and max as we traverse the array. So every time I look at a value, uh, a value associated with my index position, I'm going to compare it to min. And if min happens to be bigger than whatever the marker is I'm currently looking at, then min becomes that new marker. That means the marker is less than my minimum value. So it becomes the new minimum. Um, and I'm going to do the same thing with max. If max happens to be smaller than my marker, if my marker is bigger than my current maximum value, then that marker becomes the new maximum value. So I'm gonna continue through every element from start up to and including end. And every time I find a value that's, uh, that's smaller than my minimum or bigger than my maximum, then I'm gonna replace either my minimum or maximum with that value. And once I've done that, once I've gone through the entire 
um, the entire traversal from my starting point to my ending point, and I've determined which one is the minimum, which one is the maximum, the last step is just to return either a true or false whether or not the difference between max and min is less than or equal to 10. So in this case, if the difference between max and min is less than or equal to 10, we're going to get a true result, which gets returned. If this is a false statement, if min and max is not less than or equal to 10, uh, if that becomes false, we return false. So there is our solution, uh, a solution to part A. Now, again, there are other ways this could be implemented. There are other little nuances. Um, this is just one solution. So. How did everybody do? Did you have all of the main pieces there? Did you traverse from the starting point to the ending point inclusive? Did you do a proper check for minimum and maximum? Did you return a correct value? I hope so. OK, let's take a look at part B. Part B is a little bit different. Part B says we're going to write the trail method is difficult. And it says a trail is rated by counting the number of changes in elevation that are at least 30 meters, either up or down. That's important that we make sure we're looking at both up and down um, between two consecutive markers. And it says a trail with three or more such changes, that's a difficult trail. OK, that would be a tough one. Um, so we've got another example. So as I look at the data that we were given at the beginning of our problem, and again, this is just one example, as we go through and look, we can see the number of changes in elevation uh, that are greater than 30 meters, uh, that are at least 30 meters, either up or down. When we start at position zero, we start at 100. Well, we increase 150 meters, and then we decrease 45 meters. Both of those um, exceed our 30 minimum. 30 meter limit. Um, when we go from 105 to 120, okay, that's an increase in elevation of 15. So that one's not too bad, but 120 to 90, that's a decrease in 30 meters. So that's another one that we would count. 90 to 80 is okay, but then 80 to 50, we're decreasing 30 meters. And from that point on, you know, we're not hitting our 30 meter threshold anymore. 50 to 75 is only 25 meters. You know, here we've got a breath of fresh air on our trail where we're not increasing or decreasing at all. It's fairly level. So you get the idea as we go through and count, we've got four changes in elevation that exceed our 30 meter, either increasing or decreasing threshold between our two consecutive markers. Okay, so uh, let's take another pause. And now that we know what we're looking for, again, um, keep in mind that part of the algorithm here is that we're comparing consecutive values. And we've talked about that in a couple of our past sessions. Um, think about what we have to do when we set up the array, uh, or I should say when we set up the for loop to traverse the array, if we're comparing consecutive values, we wanna make sure we're thinking about things like bounds errors and things like that. Um, we're also keeping a counter, so, so think about some of that as well. Press pause, think about the algorithm, see if you can sketch out a solution. And when you're ready to go through it, Press play and we will continue. And we are back. Okay, welcome back. How did we do? Um, boy, all of this is making me want to go out and hit the trails. And the weather's pretty nice these days in Ohio, too. We're hitting 60s and 70s, so it's good hiking weather. Um, okay, so as we did before, we have our method header, which is a public method. We've got a Boolean return type. Our name is, is difficult, and we've got no parameters, which is great. Um, we're tracking the number of changes that exceed 30 meters, either increasing or decreasing. So right off the bat, the first thing we have to do is we need to create a variable to keep track of the number of changes. So I'm just going to call it num changes. It's an integer value, and we're going to initialize it to zero because at this point, we really haven't counted anything yet. OK, then we're going to prep our traversal. We have to traverse the entire array from zero all the way to the end, because this one we're looking at the entire trail. So we're going to set our starting value at zero. Now, remember what I said before we took our little pause so that you could work it out. We have to think about the fact that we're comparing consecutive elements within the array. So we have to make sure that we protect ourselves from going out of bounds. When I'm looking at the second to last element, I'm going to compare it to the last element. Well, that's where I need to stop. If I go on and I try and compare the last element to whatever would come next, that's where we could run into a problem because there is no next element after the last one. So I need to make sure I'm, I'm stopping one short. OK, so here's our for loop. Once we hit the for loop, this is where we do the comparison, right? In this case, I'm checking the difference between the marker at position i and the marker that's right beside it at position i plus 1. And I'm counting the number of times that that difference is greater than or equal to 30. Every time that difference is greater than or equal to 30, I increment the number of changes. But there's a problem with what I've got here, OK? Anybody see it? We said that it's very important we keep track of whether or not the, the difference 
is greater than or equal to 30, either increasing or decreasing. And we don't know which one of these is going to be the greater value, which means now we have to kind of go back into, um, you know, remember in an earlier session when Tim was talking about our math methods, we need to pull math.abs. It's going to give us the absolute value of our difference. So it doesn't really matter if it's a negative value or a positive value, if the value itself, either positive or negative, ends up being greater than or equal to 30 when I take the absolute value, that's our difference of either increasing 30 or decreasing 30. And that'll cover us both ways. So if the absolute value of my difference between marker i and marker i plus one is greater than or equal to 30, we increment num changes, that's gonna give us our correct count. And so finally, the last thing we need to do is just return whether or not that number of changes is greater than or equal to three. So if this Boolean expression is true, it'll return true. If the Boolean expression is false, it'll return false. Um, and I, again, I wanted to stress that this is a solution. It is not the only solution. So I have an alternate return statement that, that you know, to me, um, you know, this just seems a little clearer. Instead of having return of the Boolean, you know, sometimes I tell my students, even if it's a couple extra lines of code, it might be a little clearer in your head. So we could also do this. We could say if num changes is greater than or equal to three, return true, else return false. Um, and again, I just wanted to throw that in as an example of something that would also work that would earn full credit, but isn't part of the actual solution that we show. So it's just an alternate statement. Okay. Hopefully everybody did great. Um, and now I'm ready to go out and hit the trails. Let's go. Okay. Into the mountains. Hit. We can do it. Ooh, I would love it. I wish there were mountains. Eh, we've got some hills in Ohio. That's really the best we can hope for. We we have no mountains in Florida. <laughs> no mountains we, in Florida. We, we we are flat. You've got beaches. That's okay. You've got beaches to make up for hills and mountains. Sure. Not a lot of hiking. Well, you can hike on the beach, I guess. It's not really not quite the same. But uh, uh, well, hey, what should we take away now uh, from this entire session? Well, uh, again, there's that that. The uh, the falling uh, documents into our file here. So so many things. We we talked about the uh, the bit of the day opened up with our multiple choice question tips that we had. Uh, Rob had a great extensive review on searching and sorting algorithms. A uh, lot of information there. Our multiple choice question review we covered as well. And then we hit the trail with the trail 2010 free response question, and that leads us to a bit about tomorrow's video. And Rob, I got to tell you, I think if I'm looking at Maggie, I think I see some tears under those sunglasses. Maggie looks sad. This Maggie tomorrow's, looks depressed. Tomorrow's our last episode of AP Daily Live 2022. <sighs> I'll tell you yeah. what. Well, but, but we're going to end on a high note because tomorrow's bit of the day. Um, uh, Rob's going to go over some free response question tips. Uh, we talked about multiple choice. Tomorrow we're going to talk about free response. Um, we're going to look at 2D array indexing. Uh, basically, uh, focus back on 2D arrays and and how we uh, we can traverse and the different ways uh, that we can utilize those. And uh, then a multiple choice question review. I think you got a recursion one thrown in for tomorrow, don't you? I do. I've got a couple of recursion ones thrown in. Awesome. And then uh, we're going to finish things up with uh, a 2D array free response question from 2014, the seating chart. And that'll be it for our second to last episode of AP Daily Live 2022 for AP Computer Science. Hey, Rob, thank you so much for joining us, everybody. Uh, it's been a thrill to have you here, and I hope you're getting a lot out of these videos. And it's been great being here with you, and I hope everybody has a great day. Hey, we'll see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, See you next Jim. time. Awesome. See you next time, Rob. Thanks for watching, everybody.